The Neolithic period, also known as the New Stone Age, was the last stage of the Stone Age, which includes three periods, Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic. During the Neolithic period, significant changes took place, such as the emergence of megalithic architecture, the spread of agriculture, and the use of polished stone tools. The exact starting point of the Neolithic period varies across different regions of the world and depends on the development of agriculture. Agriculture began at different times in different places. In the Near East, it started around 9000 BCE, while in Southeast Europe, it began around 7000 BCE. Similarly, Central Europe saw the development of agriculture around 5500 BCE, and Northern Europe around 4000 BCE. In East Asia, the Neolithic period spanned from 6000 to 2000 BCE. The introduction of pottery is another aspect that complicates the dating of the Neolithic. In some regions, the appearance of pottery is considered a marker of the Neolithic period. However, pottery used does not always follow the development of agriculture. For example, in Japan, pottery appeared before agriculture, while in the Near East, agriculture predated pottery production. Due to these various factors and regional differences, the starting point of the Neolithic period can be somewhat uncertain. It's important to remember that the term Neolithic was coined in the late 19th century CE and has certain limitations in its application. The term Neolithic Revolution was popularized by archaeologist Gordon Child in the 1940s to describe the profound impact of agriculture on human populations. However, modern understanding suggests that the shift to Neolithic culture was a gradual process rather than a sudden revolution. Before agriculture became established, there was often a period of semi-nomadic life, where pre-agricultural societies moved between different campsites based on seasonal resources. Sometimes, a particular campsite would become a base camp, and the group would spend most of the year there, engaging in activities closer to agriculture, such as exploiting local plant resources. Agriculture and foraging were not entirely incompatible ways of life. Some groups might have engaged in both hunter-gatherer activities and small-scale farming throughout the year. The archaeological record indicates that the adoption of agriculture resulted from incremental and gradual changes rather than a revolutionary event. Agriculture emerged independently in different regions, and the dominant pattern was the spread of agricultural economies and a reduction in hunting and gathering activities. Hunting economies persisted in marginal areas where farming was not viable, such as frozen Arctic regions, dense forests, or arid deserts. The introduction of agriculture brought about significant changes, including forest clearance, the cultivation of root crops and cereals that could be stored for long periods, and the development of new farming and herding technologies like plows and irrigation systems. With more intensive agriculture, there was an increase in food production, leading to larger populations, the growth of villages, and the emergence of more complex social and political organizations. As village populations grew denser, they evolved into towns and eventually into cities. Agriculture, therefore, played a crucial role in shaping human society and how it interacted with the environment. During the Neolithic period, there were significant developments that transformed the way communities lived and interacted. One crucial change was the shift towards a sedentary lifestyle. Neolithic groups began to settle in one place, which increased their sense of territoriality and attachment to specific locations. In the Near East, between 9600 to 6900 BCE, there were innovations in arrowheads, suggesting possible intercommunal conflicts and evidence of a form of early organized warfare. Settlements like Jericho were fortified with massive walls and ditches for protection. Advancements in stone tool production were widespread and adopted by various groups in distant locations, indicating the existence of extensive exchange networks and cultural interactions. Living in permanent settlements led to new forms of social organization. As subsistence strategies became more efficient, populations in settlements grew. Anthropological research shows that larger groups tend to develop less egalitarian and more hierarchical societies. Individuals involved in managing and allocating food resources gain social importance. In the early Neolithic, houses did not have individual storage facilities. Instead, storage and food preparation for storage were managed at the village level. For example, at the site of Jarf al Amar in North Syria, a large communal storage facility was discovered, suggesting communal cooperation in managing resources. The transition from foraging to farming was a gradual process that took several centuries. At the site of Tel Abu Huraira in northern Syria, there was a shift in diet from hunting gazelles to domesticating sheep. The consumption of ground cereal increased, leading to more tooth wear in adults. The introduction of pottery later on decreased tooth wear rates but increased the frequency of bad teeth, suggesting a change in food preparation methods, such as boiling porridge and gruel in pots. Overall, the Neolithic period brought about fundamental changes in social organization, subsistence strategies, and technology, setting the stage for the development of more complex societies in the future. Towards the end of the Neolithic era, a significant technological advancement took place with the introduction of copper metallurgy. 
This marked the transition period to the Bronze Age, also known as the Chalcolithic or Neolithic era. Bronze is a metal alloy made by combining copper with tin, resulting in a material that is harder than pure copper, has better casting properties, and a lower melting point. This made bronze ideal for making weapons, something that was not feasible with copper due to its lack of hardness to endure combat conditions. Over time, bronze became the primary material for crafting tools and weapons, rendering much of the stone technology of the Neolithic obsolete. This development signaled the end of the Neolithic period and consequently, the end of the Stone Age. The Bronze Age marked a new chapter in human history, characterized by the use of more advanced metal tools and the emergence of more complex societies. The roofs of smaller chambers were supported by a central wooden column, while larger halls had multiple rows of columns for support. The palaces also featured open courtyards and storerooms where large pottery jars were embedded into the floor to store foodstuffs, wine, and beer. Some of these jars could hold up to 750 liters, 200 gallons, each. Structures away from residential areas included potteries and smelting kilns. Various materials were used in Urartian construction, including large Cyclopean stone blocks without mortar, worked stone blocks, and mud bricks. Roofing was achieved using wooden beams or barrel vaults made of adobe bricks. The floors of prestigious buildings were often made of stone, with large basalt slabs or polychrome mosaics with geometric designs. Interior walls were adorned with frescoes, and decorative bronze plaques or cut stone slabs in red, white, or black were sometimes placed in cavities cut into the walls. Doors were crafted from thick planks of wood and secured with hinged bronze latches. The material culture of Uraja provides abundant evidence of the kingdom's wealth and prosperity. Among the surviving artifacts, pottery, objects used for religious dedications, and examples of bronze working stand out. Although large-scale stone sculptures are scarce and mostly fragmented, excavations have revealed both public and private buildings in Urartian cities adorned with interior wall paintings. These paintings, done on plaster, depict various scenes, including animals, mythical creatures, processions of gods, and everyday activities such as agriculture and hunting. The typical colors used are black for outlines, while blue and red are commonly found as well, with white backgrounds. Metalworking was a significant craft in Urartu, dating back to the 10th century BCE. Skilled artisans produced a variety of goods in bronze and copper, such as jewelry, horse bits, helmets, buckles, and candelabra. Bronze cauldrons featuring animal or human heads around the rim were also a popular product. These metal goods were often decorated using various techniques, including casting, embossing, inlaying with gold, or etching with intricate designs. One of the most prominent aspects of Urartian art is the bronze sculptures made in the round. These sculptures show an influence from Assyrian art, especially in the choice of subjects, which often include lions, bulls, mythological creatures like griffins and centaurs, and military themes, particularly horse riders. Religious art includes bronze figurines of important gods like Haldi, Teshiba, and Shivani. Some deities depicted in art remain unidentified, such as a female goddess made of bone and hybrid figures like fishmen, birdmen, and scorpion men. Royal household items are often identified by inscriptions, and these inscriptions have also helped identify Urartian works found in regions outside of Asia, including Etruscan tombs in central Italy. Additionally, other materials, such as ivory, semi-precious stones, and stag horns, were used in Urartian art. Regarding writing, early Urartu used simple pictograms, but they later adopted and adapted cuneiform writing from the neighboring contemporary Mesopotamian cultures. Cuneiform inscriptions found in the kingdom, totaling around 400 examples, indicate that the Urartian language was related to Hurrian, suggesting a common ancestral language dating back to the 3rd or 2nd millennium BCE. The decline of the Urartu kingdom occurred during the 7th century BCE in a mysterious and violent manner. Sometime between approximately 640 and 590 BCE, their cities were destroyed, leading to the collapse of their once powerful state. The kingdom had likely been weakened by prolonged conflicts with the Assyrians, and its vast territory may have become too difficult to control effectively. The exact perpetrators behind the destruction are not known for certain, but several candidates have been suggested. The Scythians and the Sumerians are among the potential culprits, as well as internal uprisings within the territories governed by the Urartu kings. The discovery of three-pronged arrowheads, typical of Scythian archers, at the ruined city of Teshibani supports the idea of Scythian involvement. The city's sudden destruction by fire, sometime between 594 and 590 BCE, appeared to have caught the inhabitants by surprise. Granaries were found recently filled, and weapons and precious belongings were seemingly abandoned hastily. It is likely that the downfall of the various cities within the Urartu kingdom occurred at different times, and different peoples may have been involved in the destruction over a span of two or three decades. Following the collapse of Urartu, 
the Medes gradually took over the territories from around 585 BCE onwards. Eventually, these regions were incorporated into the Achaemenid Empire under the rule of Cyrus the Great in the mid-6th century BCE. Despite the kingdom's demise, the Urartian language survived into the Hellenistic period. Many of the former Urartian towns remain significant settlements throughout antiquity, and some of their names have endured to this day. However, as the knowledge of Urartu was not recorded or known to ancient Greek historians, it was not until the 19th century CE archaeological excavations that the importance of this regional Bronze Age culture was recognized.